Please open your Bible with me. If you have a copy of the scriptures, we'll be in Acts chapter 2 from verses 4. Before that, let's ask for God's blessing as we read his word. Lord, we are before you again, asking of you that you would fill us with your spirit, fill us with understanding, and as we read your word publicly, we pray that in your own very special way, you will come into our heart, speak deeply and personally to us this morning as we fellowship with your word. Give us understanding and may the meditation of our hearts and the word we speak be accepted before you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we stopped um, verses 4 where we see the Holy Spirit filling the disciples and they began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. So please, if you have your Bible, let us read together from verses 4 as we continue. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome and Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of our God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking them said, They are full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men, Say to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, Let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my man servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders, wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood 
before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God through him in your midst, as yourself also know, God did through him in your midst. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoices and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ that his soul was not laid in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is one of the powerful messages we'll hear from the Bible. One of the most powerful preachings that we hear right at the beginning of the church. And our subject this morning is the call to salvation. The call to salvation. We see here that the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples as they were waiting upon the Lord. We talked about it. And what is happening as we continue to see is the subject that has caused a lot of division in many of the denominations because of how we project what is written in the scriptures. The Bible tells us in verses 4 that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
If you are a proper reader of the Bible, you see the trail and what the writer is talking about. Especially the big subject of tongues. Where I got born again some years ago. The evidence that you're born again was for you to speak in tongues. Some of you know that, right? You have to say things that you don't know. You have to repeat. And in fact, if you've gone there for a few weeks and you seem not to get it, they will coach you on how to do it. Say this word. Shama, Raba. Hunter. Repeat these words after me so that you will be known as the person who has been filled with the Holy Spirit because you're speaking in other tongues. And they say that, you know, when you want to worship deeply, you speak in these tongues because the enemy does not understand what they are. When Josh was teaching through First and Second Corinthians, you know, Paul talks about it. He talks about the tongues. Though I speak with the language of the angels, and I have no love, I'm just like a what? A clinging symbol. I'm just making a lot of noise. But the thing again, he says, that he, he doesn't say, hey, People should not speak in tongues. He says, whoever speaks in tongues, he is edifying God. He's speaking mysteries to God. But also you should pray that you will understand what you're talking about. I want to know what I'm saying to God, right? I want to pray with understanding. Not just blabbing things for the sake of Feeding into a religious group. I want to know what I'm saying to God. Because it was evident when the Spirit came upon them, they spoke the wondrous things of God, and it was audible enough for people to hear. So please, don't be confused. It is as simple as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance and they spoke in the language that can be learned. A language that you can hear, that you can understand. How did they know they were speaking, you know, wondrous things to the Lord? What was the significance of this occurrence? Number one, Jesus is fulfilling his promise, as we have talked about. He says in Mark 16, 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Jesus said it. It is happening because they are speaking in a language they never spoke before. But it's a language that can be understood. Jesus said it. And another aspect that we talked about, it was spontaneous. They didn't program God. They didn't program the Holy Spirit and say, well, in such a, such a time, he's going to come, he's going to fail us, and these are the things we are going to say. People are going to get confused, but we don't care about that. It was very spontaneous. That means it was outside their timings. You cannot time God and say, He's going to do it this day or the next minute. He comes when He wants. And then also we see that everyone was included because when the cause of fire rested upon them, it was not just the 11, it was the 120. Everyone was included. The 
the Spirit gave them utterance. He did not force himself into them or overpower them, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak the great things that God had done. What are these great things that they were speaking about? I believe it was the story of redemption that Peter is mentioning. He says, it will come to pass that those who will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. So essentially, this story is the story of salvation. The story of how we were redeemed. You remember the 40 days when Christ was here with them before the ascension? He was teaching them, explaining things about the Messiah, about himself for 40 straight days. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, he reminded them of all these things. And they began to speak them. I mean, think about it. If you got nothing in you, what will he remind you about? You gotta have something. You gotta read the word. So that's clear, I believe. We shouldn't be confused about the tongues. It is just, in other words, he uses actually the word interchangeably. He says language and tongues. Language and tongues. It is not complicated. It is, do you know what language means? <laughs> it means language. Something that people can speak and you can understand them. Right? And the other reason why they were marveling is because these were Galileans. They had something about them because these were pretty much not learned people. Many of them were not learned. So how be it that they speak correctly our language wherein we were born? They've never been to my country. They've met, never been to Asia, to these other parts of the world, but they would speak fluently, flawlessly this language. And that in itself was amazing. And at the same time, it was confusing. It was confusing to these guys. Say, these people who are dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under the earth. They gathered for the sake of celebrating the feast. And they're wondering, what is this sound? There are two aspects here. It's either they were confused, first of all, with the mighty rushing wind. They heard it, and they were confused what it means. And also they heard them speak the wondrous things of God. Or they were confused about both. They're just confused. They had it. Are these Galileans? How be it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Remember, it's, it's very early in the morning. It's 9 a.m. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Some of us are still struggling to wake up. <laughs> 9 a.m. They were already up. They were already praying. The coals of fire have already rested on them. They've had the wind. And Peter is saying, hey, it's early in the morning. Even if we were supposed to be drunk, <laughs> it's not now, at least. Or he could have said, man, we, we are not drunk with wine. At least we are drunk in the Holy Ghost. That would have seemed very spiritual, right? They are spirit-filled. They are drunk in the Spirit. But whatever these people are coming from, says here, how is it that we hear each 
in our own language. Now he says language. He had said tongues. So don't be confused. Tongue. When, when you say, you know, I, I was speaking in my mother's tongue. What do you mean? That is basically your native language. Right? Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. In their gathering, they were confused with the sound they hear, and then they came close to pay attention, really. And what did they hear? They heard them praising God. When the Holy Spirit failed the disciples, they praise God with every other tongue, but it's only the crowd outside that was confused. Do you know many times, not just a few times, many times, a true believer will be so confusing to the people who do not know God. Because the language you speak, the language of faith is so confusing to them. I mean, how, how are you speaking of the things that aren't there as if they are? The Bible said that now faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things to come. The evidence. This, it is evidently that I'm carrying a Bible, right? Evidently, I'm trying to hide it. <laughs> Faith is seeing things that the natural eye doesn't see. And so, the, those people who are walking with the Lord, the believers, will speak languages that will confuse the people who are not aware of what is happening. You're praising God and you're wondering, why are these people praising God? These people, he's in pain. He just lost a loved one. This just happened to them. This happened. How is it that they can still find it easy to praise God? To lift their hands in worship and say, God, you're worthy no matter what happens. How is it possible? It is confusing to those who do not know the Lord. But they were confused because they were speaking the wonderful works of God. So they were very amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this be? Do you know what the Bible says up there? There were Jewish people who were devout men. These people knew what was written in the scrolls. Learned men who understood the times and seasons. That is why they are gathered in Jerusalem for this specific season to come. And in fact, their expectation was to receive the Messiah even at this time. But what is happening is they don't see that. They're getting confused with this kind of language. These praises are confusing to them. Devout men who have spent the rest of their lives going to the temples and giving alms and helping people and doing all these things. They have accomplished all the religious requirements for righteousness. They're here. But they're still amongst the people who are confused. Why? Because they didn't program God to come in this way. He showed up in a way that was amazing. They didn't expect it. And others were mocking. So those who didn't want to think about it deeper, <laughs> they just decided, well, 
these guys are drunk. They were drinking. It's like they were drinking the whole night. That, is, well, that was their conclusion. But think about it. Where they are gathered, 120, people outside there, thousands of people, by the way, it's like they are coming, they are, you know, calling each other like, hey, go, hear it for yourself. Hear it for yourself. Hear it. These were more than, maybe more than 5,000 people. Because three thousands of them got born again. So this was a lot of people. Think about it. Even when they are debating amongst themselves, the disciples could hear them still. You know what Peter said? He stood up with the rest of the uh, apostles, the eleven raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my voice. I love his tone. I love the change of his tone. This is not the Peter who, you know, after Jesus died, took the disciples back to fishing because they lost hope. A hopeless men who could not defend themselves or even himself. But after they have received the power to be witnesses, God's power, look at what he's doing right now. It is amazing. You know, when God is doing a new thing, our reaction will inform us or others what we think about the occurrence. When God comes into the room or in your life, what does it tell you? And what does it communicate to the people out there? In every Christian gathering. This is what should be hard. The praises of God. Not the praises of man. When we are gathered as we are gathered this morning, what are we here to do? To give God the praises. That's our job. The preacher man writes and says that it is the duty of man to worship God all the days of his life. That is our duty, to honor God with our lives. So he stands to defend these people and to defend the gospel. And he begins to bring the prophecies. As was written, let me just back up a little bit and go to Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 28, this is what was originally written, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And he goes on. I want you to see or notice the change of the tone when the apostle is presenting this prophecy. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says who? God. So God said it through the prophet Joel that in those days afterwards it shall come to pass that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Now he says here, it shall come to pass that in the last days God says that I will pour out my spirit. 
In other words, he's saying to these people as they're hearing that those last days are here with us. And we are living in those last days. Though this prophecy is fulfilled in parts, there are other parts that talks about, you know, the, I will show wonders, wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. These things will come later. So this prophecy is fulfilled in part. And the part that is fulfilled is what they experienced when the Holy Spirit came upon them. They began to speak. Literally, when you talk about the prophecies in that context, is they began to speak audibly what is hard to the people. They spoke of the wonderful things God did. And this is the message of the gospel. You see how he ends in verses 21. Say that it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls. So... Everyone is included. All these towns and cities that are mentioned here, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, you know, Cretans and Arabs, all these people. You know what is happening? He says, whoever. Everybody is welcomed in. You're welcome to join in. Every spirit-filled person will always stand up for righteousness. And that is what the apostle is doing. He is standing up for what is right, not what people think. Because what they are thinking out there is drunkenness. What is really happening is they are filled with the Holy Spirit. They are empowered to speak forth of the praises of the Most High God. And this is now the gospel presentation. In the gospel presentation, there are aspects that must be there when we are sharing the gospel with people. It doesn't matter who they are. Number one, Jesus' death was in the foreknowledge of God. People must know that. They must not think that this was just something that happened. It wasn't planned. No, this before the beginning of time, God had it in mind. Before the beginning of time, he already knew that this was going to happen. So the trail of things as things are happening generation after generation, it is just building up to the nearness or the closeness of the Messiah coming. And we see him living as a man for 33 years in this earth. He's taken up and then he's filling the disciples with power and authority. To do what? To be witnesses. That is the essence of this feeling. So, people must know that this death was, it, it was not just an accident. It just happened. It was in the foreknowledge because it's, he spoke about it here. And number two, what was the cause of death. You know, when people die, especially when we really don't know what happened, we normally ask, 
what was the cause of death? Was it pneumonia? Was it what kind of sickness was it? They will do post-mortem and all these things to verify the cause of their death. But in this case, the cause of his death is recorded here. In verses 23, it says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. So the cause of death, your sins. Cause of death, my sins. The cause of death is lawless hands that took him to the cross. I did it. I took him to the cross. I know how. My life, my lifestyle took him to the cross. And then the other also important aspect of this gospel presentation, Christ's resurrection has to be the core of our salvation. Do you talk about resurrection? Because David, being a prophet, spoke about it. And do you know what it says? That whom God raised, verses 24, God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. That was not possible for the Christ, the anointed one, to be held by death. Because David said, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. These things are being fulfilled right there. And if these people were brilliant, they are hearing the references from the Old Testament, and they're like this... Everything is adding up. Everything is now making sense in their minds. They are beginning to get it. It was not possible for him to stay there. Though he said, you know, no one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. I lay it down willingly. And then after the resurrection, we got to talk about his exaltation. He's exalted above every other name. On, on what basis are you saved? On what basis are you born again? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning not to make assumptions every time. That every time we have people gathered in his name, everyone else is born again. I don't want to make that assumption. But I want to ask us, on what basis are we going to heaven? Are we saved by works, what we are able to do? Because we have accomplished all the religious duty required by the law, or did we simply say what is written here? For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you call on his name for salvation? Or we think we are able to do things for ourselves? We, we so much believe in our ability to do things. There are things that Jesus never said, but they have become a thing for most believers in our world today. You're talking to people, especially in these interviews and, I don't know, these conversations. They make people liars. People who have nothing to do with God. They just drop the name of God for them to you know, for people to see that they are religious. 
And even those who we know as dedicated children of God, believers, they repeat words that Jesus never said. Do you know what Jesus never said? Jesus never said to you, follow your heart. He never said it. Jesus never said, believe in yourself. He never said it. Jesus never said, be true to yourself. Jesus never said, your happiness is what matters. Jesus never said, leave your truth. I feel this is true for me. Now Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me, wake up every morning, carry the cross, and follow me. You want to gain the whole world and lose your souls to hell? Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. We are saved. Yes, we are saved from what? Do we even have the boldness to stand up and talk about Jesus in public or whatever forums we have? It might be a little easier you know, in our home fellowships and Bible studies and, you know, the people we know to talk about the Bible. What about the strangers, the people you don't know? When the apostle is standing up to preach this wonderful gospel, he is not mindful, being mindful of his crowd because he knows they all need a savior. They all need Jesus. And he's presenting Jesus to them. That this Jesus, God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. That is their job. To do what? To be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Jesus said it. When you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be my witnesses from where? Jerusalem, it's happening. Brothers, what a wonderful thing to see scriptures being fulfilled in your eyes. That Jesus said it, it is happening. I believe him more. Peter was not concerned about, you know, pleasing these religious leaders and people around him. He addressed the real issue. And the real issue was the sin issue. You know what he told them? It's all of you people. You delivered the Holy One. You took him to the cross and nailed him there. It is your sin that did exactly that. Think about it. It is your sin. It wasn't the Jewish people. It wasn't the Roman soldiers. It is your sin that nailed him on the cross. Sometimes we think, you know, our sins are a little bit bearable, so it, it's not that much for Jesus to take it to the cross. At least mine is bearable. I don't say these words. I don't do these other things. I help people. I just do these things a little bit, just a little bit. There's no, no sin is little. Sin is sin. And if there is or there are things in your life that you're hiding, you got to bring them to Jesus. Bring all your weights to Jesus. He will give you something that is lighter for you. Why burdening yourself with the weight of sin? When I was 
reading and just praying and thinking about these words, it got really deep into me. I started thinking about these words, what they really meant for the people who religiously had accomplished a lot of things, and you're telling them, forget about what you know. You need Jesus. Whatever you know didn't save you. It is all we receive from Jesus that makes us clean. What are you concerned about? Do you got things in your life that you need to let go? Then you have an opportunity to let them go. All these people, they were gathered in the name of the Lord, but apparently they needed Jesus. He's always available for those who will call on his name. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's amazing what he writes about David here in verses 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, Who, who is saying these words? The Lord God, creator of the universe, say to my Lord, Jesus Christ, in other words, God the Father, he's calling Jesus God, and David knows it. David knows it. While many of us do not know him as a Lord and God. You know, this was very important, especially for the Jewish people, because everywhere the name of the Lord Yahweh would be invoked, they, they wouldn't confuse who he was. And Peter is telling them, hey, the one I'm talking about is Yahweh. I'm talking about God. You guys nailed him to the cross. That was hard to think about. It was hard to ponder. But he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. End of story. His Lord. Is he Lord over your life right now? Is he only Lord, you know, in some a few aspects of your lives? Is he Lord over your life? As I bring the worship team to come, think about the redemption story, salvation, how it came about. That we were so deceived, so messed up, living in our sins. The Bible says in John that he came to his own people. They did not even receive him. But the ones who received him, the Bible says he gave them the power to become sons and daughters of God. To become. 
And this Jesus God has raised up, which we all are witness. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, he poured out this which you now hear. In other words, I want to help your confusion. <laughs> Whatever you hear today is what God spoke about. If you know your Bible, it is written. The question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? On what basis are you saved? Some of us, we, we think about heaven. But really what takes people to heaven, we haven't encountered. You, you, you don't have to know a lot of doctrines for you to go to heaven. All you need to do is to accept Jesus and, and, as Lord and Savior of your life. You know, I've had the sermon of Alistra Begg, this great preacher, was talking about the cross. And he was visualizing the man who Jesus said to, you know, in this day you will be with me in paradise. He was visualizing this. You know, this guy gets to heaven and all the angels are wondering like, hey, and how, how did you get here? Are you cleared in the doctrine of justification by faith? Are you cleared on other major doctrines of the church? Are you a follower of the tulip? I mean, do you, do you know any of this? Like, I've never had none of those in my life. What is the basis of your coming in? How is it that you're here? What brought you here or how did you get here? You know what he said? The man on the middle cross said I could. The man on the middle cross said I could come. I'm here. I don't know about all these doctrines. I don't know about all these linguistics that we talk about in deep theology. I don't know these things. All I know is the man on the middle tree said I can come. And I'm here. Are you saved by works? Because if we don't preach the cross, we tend to lean towards salvation by works the things I can do so that God will accept my sacrifice the things I offer to him friends I do not know when Christ is returning I know it's coming soon Soon enough that I should purify myself. The Bible said that those who have this hope to purify themselves. Am I going to continue in my sin because people are not seeing what I do? Because they're, they're not aware of my lifestyle so I can get away with things. In the old times, they catch you um, in adultery, they will kill you. In the new covenant, they, they don't have, we don't have to catch you. Jesus says what? If you desire someone sexually, you have committed adultery. And do you know what you deserve? Stones, to be stoned to death. And do you know the only one who deserves to throw the stones is Jesus Christ.
In other words, he knows the condition of your hearts right now. You can't hide it. He knows it. Brothers and sisters, we cannot hide things from our God. He knows. Follow your heart, follow your heart. No, you know what the Bible says? The heart is deceitful beyond comprehension. How many times have you followed your hearts and landed in trouble? <laughs> How many times, if you're honest, you know you have followed your heart and you did regret about the decisions you made? Follow your heart? No, I would say follow God. Follow the heart of God. He's written His will on these pages. Follow his heart. Read his word. I don't know where you stand today. But I want to pray with us. If there is anyone in our midst. Who is not born again. Or those who did backslide. The Lord is always calling on us. He says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You will be saved. Not tomorrow, not next year. Paul Reminds us that the time of salvation is right now. Sometimes we get ashamed in front of people. I don't want to make this decision in front of this multitude. I believe it wasn't easy even for these people who got born again that will read next week the great harvest that happened after this powerful preaching by the apostle. Just reading it in itself, so powerful. I don't know what it spoke to you as we read it. I know what it has spoken to me. I know. I don't want to take him back to the cross again because of my sins. Because that is not possible for him to be taken back to the cross, to die the second time. But what I know, that he will show up the next time he comes. He's not coming to die on the cross, but he's coming to take the church. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh Lord God Almighty, we thank you. When we look to thee, sinless Savior who sits on the throne. Do we see our sins taken away? Lord, we know that you're here with us. We know that you speak to us in your special way. You're always convicting us always speaking to us through your Holy Spirit. If there is anyone amongst us who wants to receive Jesus, raise your hand up. We'll pray with you. Because Jesus is calling.
anyone backsliding who needs the Savior, He's calling on you right now. We'll pray with you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word that is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we thank you that you're so mindful of us that you're giving us opportunities to make it right with you, God. And I thank you for those in our midst who are crying out for you. That they need a change of heart. They need a change of perspective. Lord, I pray that you visit them and visit all of us, really. We all need you. I, I will pray that we'll not only fill ourselves with the religious knowledge about you and we have not encountered your touch in our lives. So please, God, we ask you again to fill us with your Spirit. We need you. I need you, Lord. Fill us with your Spirit. Empower us to be your witnesses, not just at home where we are, our Jerusalem, but so there will be witnesses everywhere in the world where we have an opportunity to speak of the marvelous and wonderful things you have done. Be enthroned, O oh God, in our lives. And I pray that you will quicken our hearts to be sensitive to your spirit that when you are sending us to go out, we will not hesitate. We will go out. Thank you, God. As we serve you this morning with our offerings, our finances, we pray that we'll give a glorifying percentage of our income to you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.